Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. One of the things that you have to learn to do when you're a musician is to jump between one note and, and, uh, and another note, just going from high to low or just doing different notes at different intervals. And you have to get used to the fact that sometimes if you're playing a woodwind, you have to use a different tension in your mouth a little bit or your lips on your embouchure. You may have to use a little different airflow, either more or less, in order to get certain notes. Some some of the notes that are most difficult to get on the woodwinds are the low notes, not the high notes. The high notes, you can just simply just play them. And it's very natural for most instruments, including flutes and recorders, to play high notes. The lower notes are harder to get. You don't have to have near as much air to do that. And sometimes the tendency is to overblow. If you overblow an instrument, it means that you're putting in too much air in the instrument, and usually you just get a squeal. I'll try to demonstrate that now. Here's a G, and it's fine. There's nothing wrong with this G. Let me overblow it. What I get here is an octave because I'm putting in more air, but I could also get a squeal like that. What I did to get the squeal was I also withdrew my thumb a little bit from the thumb hole in the back as well as overblowing it. So those overblow notes are actually tones, and they're called sometimes overtones, but they are actually notes, but you wouldn't want to hear them played when you're playing something else. If you wanted to hear them played, you'd write for it, you'd make it a regular sound, and you'd practice it so you would get it in good and clear like a regular regular note. It wouldn't be squealy. Some notes and some instruments are squealy anyway if they're very high and you're not used to playing. But the thing is to get good even tone. Now we've been working with intervals and jumping between intervals. Like for example, I can do this. That's an arpeggio. An arpeggio is like a chord, but you're playing one note at a time. You're not playing them together because woodwinds can't do that. Woodwinds can only play one note at a time. But if you're on a piano or a guitar or a violin, you could play more than one note at a time. But when you're playing a chord and you're playing that one note, it's called an arpeggio. So if you jump around, You're just jumping around. Sometimes the notes are closely spaced. Sometimes you're, you're, you're jumping around from a high to a low note or vice versa. Now, for what I'm doing now for the intervals, well, we went through a group of them on the last segment, and I'm going to start with a sixth interval. Now, sixth intervals are usually very pleasant to listen to. If I were to play a note and play uh, a sixth above it or a sixth below it, it would be pleasant to listen to. Naturally, I I can't do that at the same time on the quarter. But so I've written this song and continuing with the intervals as we're doing, and I'm going to try to complete a lot of it on this session, maybe even all of it. I'm going to do six. So I've got this music up here. Here's your treble clef, and most of the woodwinds play in the treble clef. And then you have four, four time. That means there are four beats to a measure, and a quarter note gets one beat. So if you are to count this, this would be like four, and then one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That dotted half gets three beats, because a half note, if a quarter note gets one beat, a half note gets two beats, and if you put a dot beside it, it gets three beats, because that dot gives it another half of, of the time that it normally would receive. So therefore you get three beats and then this is the fourth beat. 
Now, what I could have done, and I didn't, I could have had three notes on the last measure instead of four, and then this would be the fourth note. I didn't do it that way. I didn't think it's particularly important, but a lot of music is written so that if you have a partial measure in the beginning, which acts as an introduction, then the last measure has the rest of the time that the first measure misses. Just to make it mathematically correct, I don't think it makes any difference at all in terms of the music. Music, but sometimes you have music written like that. So the sixth is going to be from that D to that B. Can't you hear a waltz out of this? So that's a waltz I just made up. So well, let's go and watch the music as I do this at 4-4 time, and the interval is going to be a 6. Now, I changed it a little bit, but I wanted to point out something here. Uh, here, G, G, A, B flat, then B, E, and C. Now, what happens with that B flat? How do you get that B flat? G, let me, if you watch my fingers for a moment, here we have a G, G, A, B flat. This would be your B flat. A is like this, B flat is like this. A B, you would lift it off. B, A, G. G, A, B flat, B, then C. So you just need to be used to the figure. You might, with a B flat, even add another note down here just to flatten it a little more. You may, it makes it a little bit deeper, it makes it a little bit flatter. Sometimes I play both of these fingers down, and here, in, in the B, and you skip the A, you put this one down, and you put these two down, skipping the middle, and what you get out of that... But if I'm playing something that's fast, I may want to just put this finger down. So let me try that again. Now I change it again. That's the last uh, line of it. How do you get that B, C, C sharp, and D? Here's your B, C, C sharp. Just these two notes, and your thumb is off. And then this for the D, so. I think the saxophones and the flutes do it in an easier way, but this is the way it's done on the recorder. B, C, and then C sharp, and lift this thumb off, and then for the D, Take it all off, and this is the only note that the, this is the only finger that you have depressed on a, on a tone hole is this, and this is your D. Now for a saxophone, B, C, the sharp would lift everything off, and then the D you'd put everything back down. If the flute, you'd leave this open. If you have a saxophone, you'd leave that closed. 
Well, of course, the thing is you have a strap to help you with the balance. And the balance is more difficult than the recorder, but that's just the way you usually do it. B, C, C sharp, thumb off, and D, everything off except that middle finger on the left hand. And you would, of course, you could have some keys down here. You put your fingers down here to help yourself balance. Otherwise, you could drop the instrument. So that's the six. I'm going to take that down, and we'll do the seventh. The seventh is not really a good uh, 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 easy to listen to, but if you're writing music, then you can make it whatever you want it to be. So let me put this up. The seventh is almost close to the octave. An octave is an eighth, where you have the space of the eighth, and it's like the uh, like a lower note, except it's on a higher pitch. Like for example, if I play a D. That's an octave, and it's eighth. But if you have the seventh, then it's close to it. And if you put the seventh together with a note, and it's not an octave, and the vibrations are, so, are too close, it doesn't sound good at all. Now, what I did was write a song, and, uh, and it's based on seventh. So it's a simple song. And if you just follow it, three, four time, which means it's waltz tempo, one sharp, which means it's in the key of G. And uh, you start off with that first note, which is also the introduction. And you'll notice that this is one beat as for the first measure instead of three, but it acts as an introduction. And then on the end, I put a half note. So the combination of this half note, which is two beats, and this one single note, which is a quarter note, one beat, makes it mathematically correct. Although I don't think it makes any difference at all, but just to let you know. So let me play this. This is not going to be too fast. It's like a waltz tempo. Now, how do you get from that low D to that high D? That's your octave right there. You take your low D, which is this, six fingers and the thumb hole covered, and you just lift everything off, except for that middle finger on the left hand, which is closing the second tone hole down. That's your octave right there. A flute would do it this way. The fingers would stay closed, and you'd just lift up the top one. Much easier to balance. For a saxophone, you would just press an octave key and keep the figurings the same, which I can do on a recorder, but that's not the way it should be done. And it's not really secure, but you can force it if you know how to do it. You can tweak it to do it, but that's the way the saxophone would do it. The flute has it different, where you lift this finger, and then with a the recorder, you just take everything off. Look, Ma, no hands. So how do you balance on a recorder? You don't have a strap like the saxophones do. It's not a heavier instrument. You don't have your fingers closed like you would have on a flute. And you don't have anything to balance except your mouth partially balances that instrument. Your mouth partially does it, and generally speaking, you can leave two or three fingers on the bottom, and it won't affect the pit. And if you put your finger down like that, the pinky finger down, it just aids in the balance so the instrument doesn't go flying. It's possible to drop an instrument if you don't have it secure. And one way to make it secure is just to have one or two fingers down, and you can see my mouth balances it on one end, and these two fingers balance it on another end, on the other end, and that keeps it much more secure. 
instruments do get broken when they're dropped. Let me try this again and just figure the, figure the way that you would count it. F three, one, two, three. Now, if you have one beat, one note, and that acts as an introduction to the song, instead of counting one and then going back to one again, one, two, three, you would count that as three. In other words, you're playing the last note of a measure had it been written in, but it hasn't been written in. So you count that as three, and then you start one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And uh, that will actually uh, uh, work for you in terms of how to count the, the music. And then here you have a retard, so you're slowing it down. And then when you get to the end, you have that two beats, and then you have a hold on it. So you hold it longer than two beats. Beats. You can hold it as long as you want to hold it, but you don't probably want to hold it too long because there wouldn't be any purpose on it. So let me try this again. It doesn't go fast. I could make it go fast, but it doesn't go fast. Now here's another example where you have a part of a, of a phrase and you're repeating it as the ending of the song. You're repeating it and you're making it go slower. And that's the end of the song. So if I can take it um, from here, uh, and then just complete it. You can see I'm, fr I'm going to be repeating that or a phrase like it. And that's the end of the song by repeating that. Okay, so. And that's the end of the song. You don't have any real markings in here except for that retard and the fact that you're going slower and the fact that you're holding it. But you're not, you don't have any DCs, you don't have any DSs, you don't have any repeats, you don't have anything complicated at all. And so you can actually write a very simple song by not making it complicated and focusing on various timing and also the fact of the intervals between the notes. So let me take that down. Now we're working with octaves. Now what I'm going to play, it's a little bit hard to play. And if you want to play it, uh, uh, then what you need to do is you need to go slow with it because there's a lot of octaves in it. Remember, octaves are sometimes a little tricky to get. For this D I've already explained, what about E? What you do for most octaves is that you take your thumb and you take your thumb, or you pull it down a little so you don't have the hole fully covered. That's called half holding. So you're pulling it down a little bit. And that will bounce a note. How, it will bounce a note up an octave. Now, it doesn't work with every note, but it works for many notes, and so that's the way that you do it on a recorder, and I can go up and down the scale that way. For the D, you usually don't do that because you want to lift all of these fingers up to get a better tone on it and a more accurate tone, but a lot of it's like for the E, the F, the G and the A, it's one way to do it. A high B, you would want to do something else. There are different fingerings for the high B and the high C. But a lot of, of uh, even, uh, even uh, people doing uh, uh, like G sharps, F sharp, accidentals like that, you can still do it the same way by pulling your thumb down and so it's not completely clear. It's about halfway, which you have to guess at because you can't see it. So you have to go by feel. And you have to learn also when you're playing an instrument, you don't look to see if your fingerings are right as a general rule. If you're a beginner and you want to make sure you have your fingerings right, you might look. But when you're playing and you're playing a song, you don't look to see that it's right. 
You know, it, 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 it's just, it's bad, bad form, and you're going to lose the position of your hands. Your hands should always be curved over an instrument, never like this. You do not use flat fingers. Like the uh, fingers are gently curved over the holes, and you feel the holes. You can feel the indentations where the holes is, and that's how you know that you've got the right note. And then you go ahead and you play the song, but you're not checking your fingerings. Some people want to look at a mirror to see if their fingerings are right. But that's a dangerous practice because a mirror reverses everything. So you're not going to see everything. You're not going to see anything right because you're going to see everything in reverse of what you've done. It's a very bad practice and don't start it because you're going to wish you hadn't. You're going to get yourself in a mess with it. So this is not so easy to play because I've got a lot of seventh and eighth. It's basically a song on octaves, but I've got some sevenths in here too. And so I'm going to play it slow. This is the way it goes. That's the whole song, except I do have a repeat sign here. The repeat sign, I don't have a repeat sign there, but it's obvious that's where you go back to, because there really isn't any place that you can go back to. There's no repeat signs anywhere, so you have to go back to the beginning. And so this G, you'd start playing the D again and start it all over again. And then when you get back here, the song is ended. You no know first endings, no second endings. I can put those things in. In, but I don't have to. Now what's going to be uh, tricky about this is the fingering. So if you watch my fingerings, uh, this is what, how I'm going to do it. practice to go from one note, uh, consider it a bass note, like the E's and the D's, which I have here. I have a whole group of D's, and later on I have some E's. And what you're doing is you're just going back to that note. You're playing other notes and going back to that note repeatedly. And so you get a song like this where you're bouncing back and forth, basically with octaves, although sometimes the top notes are not the same, so therefore it can be a seventh or a sixth. But you're going back to that repeatedly, going back to that G. And so you get used to playing that D, and you get used to bouncing around with different notes in different intervals. It's an actually a good study of intervals. But if you try to do it fast, you're going to get mixed up with it, because it's not that easy to play. You have a lot of hand movement. The notes themselves aren't, aren't bad by themselves. But the way that I've put them together means that you are using intervals a lot, and what's going to happen is that you're going to be, e it's easily misconstrued, it's easily made mistakes. If you want to do that fast, then you might have a problem. Well, uh, I think we've come to the end of our time, so we have gone through all of them. I think what I might do next time is I'm going to do various intervals in the same song so you get a chance to hear it. I'm not going to be so focused on one interval, but various intervals on various songs and some other songs that I've written up, all for the purpose of being to teach you, to, to teach you how to actually play, because playing a recorder and other instruments like it can be a lot of fun. And I've had a lot of fun doing it. So I'm going to close it here, and please join me next time. <laughs>